So welcome back to episode two, a part two of Hope for the Soul podcast. We, our last, our last discussion, we were right in the middle of a paragraph when young Pastor Trent decided that it was time for him to go doing something else. So he jumps and runs from the room, and so I'm by myself. But we're going to continue in this uh, Hope for the Soul uh, podcast. We're talking about the anatomy of an ethical of an ethical crisis and all of us have found ourselves in moments when we're faced with a decision that whichever way that we decide is hard it's, it's going to be painful and so um by way of, of review uh, we, we simply talked about um that when you're faced with one of these crises uh, there's there's three ways to respond you can deny this thing hopefully it'll go away but it, it, things that are that are not dealt with, unresolved issues uh, become bigger, become larger, and uh, they seem to exponate themselves and, and they grow. So when we realize we can't get by with just being in denial, we find ways to defer that um, the action. So we defer it, and by deferring it, we invite others to help us. We seek counsel. We seek help. We try to get – at times we even uh, – we, we, we as people, we – can be found guilty of trying to manipulate others to to solve this problem for us. And so there's times that not only have we been drawn into someone else's crisis, but but there's times that people have uh, involved themselves in this crisis as well. So there are invited and uninvited participants in in our crisis. So uh, I've come to the conclusion that we always have to deal with these things. We just have to face up and we just have to deal with this crisis and and um, when when I when I do that, I, I discover that God always provides a pathway. Uh, there's always a pathway of escape when you do right. There's always a pathway you can navigate, and and, and God will God will help you. You see, I think it's interesting to note that most of our ethical crises are never just our own. Uh, but we've been invited into someone's or uh, we've invited someone into it. And see, we find ourselves in this situation of life where our ethical crisis becomes, uh, as people, we're composites of our past. We're composites of our yesterday. And so when King David found himself in a crisis, you have to look and realize that David found himself in a moral and an ethical crisis but if you look back, his father had a moral crisis because it's 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 taught by many that David was an illegitimate son from illicit relationship. And when Jesse was asked to invite his sons to be anointed king, David wasn't invited uh, because he wasn't a son of Jesse and his wife. But he was he was the eighth son. But he was somebody else's somebody else was his mother. And so we see that crisis. And so we, surely that David finds himself at a, a moral moment, a moral crisis, an ethical crisis, uh, but it wasn't, it, it, his father had been in the same place. And if you, tr- if you trace his lineage backwards, you can go all the way back to Jericho and find that his great, great, great grandmother had been a harlot, been the prostitute there in, uh, in Jericho. So we're a composite of, of, of our past and of our raising and those who, who went in front of us. But at the same time, we all have to face our own crisis and, and deal with him uh, as the best. So here was David in the midst of his famous crisis when the prophet Nathan comes to visit him. And when Nathan comes to visit, it seems like David's crisis has crescendoed to the point where it's it's out of control. Uh, it's kind of like that when you're you're in a crisis and the pastor says, I feel like we need to have a talk. You don't want to have that talk. I mean, you, you you don't want that because uh, because you know, face it, we don't want to face our realities. So, David's in this crisis. He has to come face to face with this crisis when Nathan the prophet comes. But we've got to be honest. David would have never been in this crisis had he been doing what he was supposed to do. If he had just done what was right to begin with, and what was right was. He should have gone to battle. It was a season when kings go to battle, and he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He stayed home. 
And had he been where he was supposed to be in the battlefield, then he wouldn't have walked out on the back part of his roof of his palace and looked out, and he, he wouldn't have looked over the fence at the neighbor's house and seen this young lady sunbathing by the, sun, by the swimming pool. If he'd have been where he was supposed to be, he'd have never been in this moment where he, he, was, he was tempted. So here he is. He's arrived at a moment where that he, he feels this temptation. And when you realize who Bathsheba was, when, when you understand that she was the wife of, you know, David had this group of mighty men. And if you, uh, you, you look at the whole list of mighty men, Uriah was the last and the youngest of all of the mighty men. So um, now he was married to this lady named Bathsheba. So when David was tempted and he called for Bathsheba, he already knew that she was the wife of one of his mighty men, one of these men that were loyal to him, one of these men that were faithful to him. And not only was she the wife of Uriah, she was the daughter of a mid-level mighty man. So if you look in the, the list of the mighty men, Bathsheba's father was about halfway through that list. And if you, if you also can trace it back a little further, and that is that Bathsheba's grandfather was one of the mighty men that from the very beginning... And even in later years, he whispered, and he had David's ear, and he would whisper to him, and he would help him and provide counsel for him. So David knew when he crossed that line with his ethical, moral decision, he knew who she was, and he knew the effects that was going to happen. But because, but because he, he was so driven to make this wrong decision, it affected not one generation, but two preceding generations, a whole family. And, and it would eventually uh, affect even us today because we, we often hear this. Uh, this situation that he found himself in and this decision he made, it was no accident that, that there was a, an illegitimate child because he made this decision. He knew who she was. He knew what he was doing. So when he is in this moment, he chooses to, to defer his crisis. And by deferring his crisis, he pulls many others in. First off, there was a lot of servants around, good, faithful servants, loyal people that were in on this because the king doesn't do anything that people are not aware. So he has all these faithful, loyal people around him. And then not only that, he decides that he's to get out of this crisis, he's going to manipulate his way out of it. So what he does is, is he sends word to bring Uriah back from the battle, and he was going to honor him. You know, understand something about people who manipulate. You will never out-manipulate a manipulator. But David decided, I can manipulate my way out of this crisis. And so he, he brought Uriah home. He, he manipulates the situation by honoring him, by, by, by being kind to him. Um, Uriah was a wise man because there's a scripture that says, beware when men speak good of you. Uh, when you hear a lot of good things about yourself, please don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't drink the Kool-Aid because uh, you never know really what's going on. Uh, there are people who are, who are gifted in telling everybody what they want to hear so, so they can keep them manipulated and moving forward in the way they want them to move. So Uriah was brought home. He was bragged upon. He was elevated. And then David says, I know it's battle time, but I'm going to give you a couple of days off. Go home and spend it with your wife. And so he, he goes home, but this good man, this loyal man, he would not go home and spend the night in his house while his men were in battle. And since that was the situation, David continued to manipulate until he sent Uriah back to the battle with the orders to his commanding officer, you put David in the most hot part of the battle. Uh, you put Uriah in the he most heated part of the battle. And while he's there, he's probably going to be killed. So here he has manipulated his way. And Uriah is a good man. He's a pure man. He's a loyal man. Uh, Uriah is, is suddenly uh, a victim of David's ethical and moral crisis. And you see, this man, Uriah, was manipulated to his own demise. You see, it's really easy when you decide to defer the problem. You find yourself 
having to find ways to manipulate other participants to support you in this crisis. And so in this, not only had David done wrong, but, but David had become, for a lack of a better word that we use today, David had become a predator in this situation. So he had become a predator. Uh, he had become a murderer because he made a single bad ethical decision to not go to battle when it's time to go to battle. It was, it was, his, it was his crisis, but his crisis became Bathsheba's. And their crises became Uriah's. And these crises became all of the servants that, that were around them. And when we find ourselves in an ethical crisis and fail to make the right decision early on, there will always be a, a, the path behind us will be littered with the corpses of those who were invited in to share in our crisis. But if we're the ones that's manipulating and we're the ones that's trying to keep uh, save ourselves. There, there will, all of these people will be manipulated in the process. They will lose out, and they will be they will be further victims, further affected by our own simple crisis. But when you look at this, it appears though that David would repent, and David would apologize, and and God would forgive him. And so it it has all of the appearances. The story has all the appearances that that David got by free. David David managed to, to stay in position. You see, it appears that he anointed, he avoided the consequences of, of his decisions. But remember something, we never avoid our consequences. We never do. Sometimes we have the appearance of avoiding it. Sometimes it looks like we, we dodge. We use the term, we dodge the bullet. And we, we avoid our consequences. But but remember this, David's greatest desire was to build a house for God. And his greatest desire was withheld from him because of his ethical crisis. And then if you look a little further, if you look at his children, uh, his next generation was filled with incest and murder and rebellion and insurrection and, and all of these ugly things that, that probably may well have been avoided if David had when in his moment of crisis had, had faced up and made the right decisions instead of the wrong decisions. But this brings me to a place that I, I mentioned a moment ago, but what about all those innocent, faithful servants who observed and knew the truth? They became victims as well of a single person's crisis. You see, innocence was consumed by the predatory nature of a single person that was in his own ethical crisis. Think about it. Innocence was consumed, and the love and loyalty of those servants was manipulated by someone else's crisis. So when we look at David, we see the devastation in his family, but we really never know how far the ripple effects of a single decision to not go to war when it was time to go to war. His decision began to, his, his crisis exponated to where it, it took in his next generation. It took in Bathsheba's family. It, it took in her husband. And, and it had all of these other problems that, that came out of this. You see, we've got to remember that, have you ever noticed, put it this way, have you ever noticed that when whenever a minister preaches about David and his being a man after God's own heart and all these wonderful things, why do they always, and I've done this a thousand times, why do they always feel like they've got to put a disclaimer? Now, David fell in sin, but he repented of it, and God forgave him, and, and because he, God forgave him and he was facing his issues, that, that he was a man after. Why do we feel the need to always place this disclaimer on the front side when we're talking about David's goodness. We feel this need to, to put this dis disclaimer. And I think that uh, in the sight of God, all of our sins are forgiven. I mean, in the sight of God, our failures are forgiven. Thank God for the blood. What is that? Page 369 of the old song book. Thank God for the blood because it, it covers our sins. It washes us. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that, that he forgives us of all of our sin, not just selective sins. But in the sight of, of God, our great sins are forgiven. However, in the sight of man, we mark ourselves when we choose to set aside ethical decisions 
and we choose to, we, we, we understand that God forgives, but somehow in our humanity, we never quite forget. Maybe it's that we don't forget. It's just that we remember. I mean, and, and, and you just don't really want to trust someone who's proven themselves to be untrustworthy. They betrayed you. And while you have forgiven their betrayal, you keep it in your mind that leper doesn't change his spots. And you, you remember these things. So in the sight of God, the great sins are forgiven, but the sight of man, it seems that, that we, it seems that we, we, we have a hard time. We have a hard time trusting those who set aside, uh, the right decisions in the midst of their own ethical crisis when it profits them to do that. So to, uh, th- there's always, uh, those that say, well, it looks like David come out of that one. Okay. But to those who keep score, and there's always people in life who keep score it, it, to the scorekeepers of life. David's walking away from this crisis makes little sense. And it appears that David was the winner. But first off, we really should, none of us should be scorekeepers, but the ultimate scorekeeper in life is God and God keeps score. And I, I would suggest that God keeps perfect records. So if God's keeping score, regardless of what happens on this life, he knows. He knows. So we have to trust him in that. But this brings me back again to all of those sweet, good, innocent servants that were tasked with facilitating and covering David's crisis. What about the servant who was sent to Bathsheba's house and invited her to come? What about the servants whom got the room ready? What about all of these people that were participants by invitation and they were just being loyal to their leader? You see, when David was confronted with the prophet, the prophet tells a tale of a little sheep that was loved and it was cherished by its master. And so, so much in fact that the family looked at the little sheep as if it was part of the family. This wasn't this wasn't just a sheep that was being raised, but this, this was the family pet. This family was emotionally involved in this sheep's life, and this sheep was part of their everyday thing. And then one day a traveler comes by, the prophet said, and um, he, he takes this sheep, this innocent sheep that meant so much for, for this family, this precious lamb, for some reason was in the yard that day, and this traveler, this, this roaming man, this man just passing through, this man who, who, who is going to, he's going to stop for a moment. He's not going to linger there. There's not going to be a relationship. Th- this roaming predatory type spirit comes in and takes that innocent lamb from the yard of this good man. And this temporary predatory traveling visitor consumes this lamb that means so much to this family. When David hears the story told by the prophet, David the king roars. And while he's still roaring, and while he's issuing edicts and thundering judgments, Nathan pointed at David and says, you're the man. You're the one who did this. And suddenly David's crisis that started so many months before of simply not going to battle, simply being lazy, simply not doing what was right in in what was seemingly an innocent moment. He's brought face to face with the reality of his crisis. So when he he comes to this and for the first time, he has, he has ignored it. He's tried to deny it. He has deferred it, but he's yet to come face to face and honestly deal with it. And in this moment, when the man of God's got his finger on his nose and saying, you're who I'm talking about, you're the guy. David comes face to face, not with the man of God, but he comes face to face with his own humanity, his own failures, his own realities that, hey, I should have done this different. He's face to face with his ethical and moral crisis. In this moment, he comes to terms with his own participation in him creating this crisis moment. He comes to to terms with it. And finally, after all of this devastation, after all of this garbage that's gone down, he decides in that moment, I'm going to face this. I'm going to deal with it. And deal with it he did. 
he took control of himself. And if you read the story, he, he humbled himself. He repented. And hence, we can talk about a man that was after God's own heart. But look at the garbage that was created when he was in ethical crisis and he made a wrong decision. The key to this whole story, I think, is simply this. We have to be willing to humble ourselves before God. What's the, what's the scripture say? Humble yourselves before God, uh, and he will lift you up. When you, when you humble yourself, you see, what keeps us, what makes us deny it, what makes us want to defer it, and what, what makes us not want to face it and deal with it is because our prides are so strong. And we don't want to face it. We've got, you know, we don't, you know, David, he was a king. He had his family. He has this legacy. He's got all of this, all of this pomp and circumstance in his life. And he can't admit that there is an issue that he failed upon. And so he wasn't honest with himself. But remember this. If there's any single passage of scripture that, that brings the, the subject of honor and integrity and humility into full focus for me, it's found in Proverbs 16, 18, and 19. It says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And I've come to learn that whenever the spirit of pride walks in or the spirit of pride is on someone and they, their, their head's high, their nose is a little bit high, their shoulders are thrown back, and they're making sure everybody notices them when they stroll in. Remember this. If pride walks in, right behind it is destruction. So when you see pride walking in, just be still. Pray for that person. Pray for them. Intercede for them in, in the spirit because when pride walks in, there's devastation and destruction right behind them. And it happens. It happens every time. When haughtiness walks in, the scripture says, when there's haughtiness there and refusal to be humble, a refusal to, to humble themselves and submit themselves to God and, and all of those things, when the haughtiness comes in, there's going to be failure right behind it. So pride precedes destruction and haughtiness precedes failure. And so that's the reason that we've got to make the right decision when we have an ethical crisis because if we don't, our ethical crisis exponates itself when we are operating out of a spirit of pride and haughtiness. And, and there's devastation around us. And there's people that are hurt and wounded and discarded and thrown to the side as we travel through with this prideful, this prideful walk in life. But this morning when I was reading this again, um, I, I read one more verse in Proverbs, just the next verse of Proverbs 16, 18. But the 19th verse this morning spoke into my spirit, and, and I trust it may speak into yours. It's simply this. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoils with the proud. If you want to be blessed of God, have an humble spirit and be content to be with the lowly people. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide all the spoils, to get all the blessings, to have all the accolades, but be standing with the proud because you can't stand with the proud unless you're prideful yourself. So let me just challenge you in this, in this moment. And I don't know how long we've talked. I've kind of just been zoned in on, on this discussion. Um, pride goes before destruction. Haughtiness precedes failure. But it's better to have an humble spirit. And if you have a humble spirit, I think you can overcome anything. If you have a humble spirit, when you're in an ethical crisis, you're going to make the right decision. And God's going to help you. And God's going to keep you. Thank you so much for spending this extra time with me here on Hope for the Soul. I know that next episode, we'll probably have back our resident jokester, Kayla, and Pastor Trent will be back. And, and we'll, just, uh, we'll just keep moving forward. Uh, we pray the blessings of God on you, upon your family. And I know that the will of God can be done. He is our healer and he is our helper. And so I pray his helping hand in your life. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next time.